It's going to be me alone today with a couple of my friends, a medical doctor, cardiologist, Dr. Lee Cowden, toward the end of the show, talking about how do you stay in shape, Dr. Cowden, a naturopathic doctor, talking about our hormones and why she left nursing. She had a bachelor's degree in nursing and a doctorate degree in naturopathic medicine. Dr. Julia is here toward the middle of the show. And then Susie Cohen, who is a pharmacist, America's pharmacist, talking about malic acid. Where do you get it? What good is it? Etc. I'm going to open today's show show talking about mycotoxin exposure. I wrote a book on this, so certainly I believe in it, contributing to a disease we call diabetes. These fungal poisons often are endocrine disruptors, and the thyroid is an endocrine gland. All that and more on this, Know the Cause. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate, and you know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. About 20 years ago, Dr. Dave Holland, he was a microbiologist and a physician, and I wrote a book uh, called infectious diabetes. You see, ringworm is infectious. It's a fungus. Ringworm is infectious. When I realized the fungal role in diabetes, I thought, wow, could diabetics be infecting each other? I changed the name to protect the innocent to the fungal uh, component of diabetes, the fungus linked to diabetes. But I still feel that in many cases, diabetes has a fungal component. Why do I feel that way? We can inject two older antibiotics into laboratory mice and they all get diabetes. Antibiotics are fungal metabolites. Fungus into mice, give them diabetes. Okay, let's go. Does mold raise the risk of diabetes? Those of you who have followed my work for many years know that I believe mold poisons called mycotoxins can cause diabetes. Several mycotoxins are used to induce diabetes in study animals. Certain diabetes drugs have antifungal properties. These are called glitazones. And fungal mycotoxins are known endocrine disruptors, fully capable of inducing blood sugar aberrations. Okay? So understand where I'm coming from, and I'm biased. I think, in America anyway, we believe disease spontaneously initiates and requires a prescription to get rid of or to treat for eight hours at a time. A new study correlates an aspergillus fungal mycotoxin called aflatoxin with increasing the risk of developing diabetes. Uh, and here is the uh, headline down below, diabetogenic effects of aflatoxins in Pakistan foods. Folks, this is especially bad, uh, aflatoxicosis in sub sahara Africa, in Pakistan, India, um, where their uh, staple is corn or wheat or peanut meal. All of these foods are impregnated sometimes, more often there than here. Our FDA looks at one of these uh, mycotoxins as potentially cancer causing. Not only can this induce diabetes, it induces cancer. Aflatoxin is known to do that. By the by, it's in our grain supply sometimes, okay? Exposure to mycotoxins may increase risk of diabetes and worsen blood sugar control. This is a paper called Chemistry and Biology of Mycotoxins and Related Fungal Metabolites, Review of Chemistry <clears throat> in the year 2009. In many parts of the world, here I go, including Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Pakistan, much of the grain supply is contaminated with low levels of aflatoxins which are produced by Aspergillus flavus and other species of Aspergillus mold. Uh, folks, they should have something in place to remediate this mold from our food supply. We don't. And I'm telling you, this isn't just a sub sahara india pakistan problem. We in America still suffer from this problem. We run to our doctor with liver cancer never once does the doctor think, are you eating corn? Are you eating peanuts? Are you eating a lot of uh, whole grains? Never once. In a 2021 study just months ago of 672 adults from Pakistan, it was reported that urine aflatoxin levels were significantly higher in diabetic patients versus non-diabetic 
people. In addition, among 320 diabetic subjects, blood sugar, so not only urine, blood levels of glucose were significantly higher in subjects with aflatoxins in their urine, as was their hemoglobin 1C and insulin levels. They're eating aspergillus mold. It off-gasses a poison in your body called aflatoxin. This is known to induce hepatocellular or liver cancer, and now we know of its link to diabetes. I'm telling you folks, the more I study the Bible, the more I begin to realize fungus was and is a huge problem. Why aren't our doctors learning about it? So the chicken and the egg, Doug, which came first? Does mold exposure cause the pancreas to begin dysregulating insulin production, mimicking diabetes? Or does the pancreas just spontaneously break and insulin production become skewed? Have you tested your environment or your food for mold? Have you laid off grains for a period of time and nuts for a period of time, fresh fruit? fresh vegetables, right? Fresh meats. And tried that for a period of time. Mold is a huge problem, folks. In the next 10 years, we'll be teaching you more and more, God willing. Thanks for watching. This is fun. Dr. Julia Schulenberg is with me right now. You've met her before on the show. Uh, uh, Dr. Julia had a bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Science in nursing, so you're a nurse. On top of that, so my question is, you then became an ND, a, a naturopathic doctor. But my family and I know your IQ. You could have become an MD. Why the ND? Why the ND, naturopath, instead of medical doctor? Well, I want to study homeopathy traditional Chinese medicine, nutrition, um, the biology of plants and how that affects our bodies, um, more so than I want to study pharmacology. I want to see what was natural that could heal us because it's, that's actually what healed my family, myself and my family, was uh, all the doing everything naturally rather than using pharmaceutical drugs. Right. So that's why I pursued naturopathy. Are there some, in some states, I have friends who are naturopathic doctors who prescribe, who can prescribe drugs. Is that so in Texas where we are? Uh, not in Texas. There's, okay. there's not a licensing board in Texas. So there are some naturopaths who can do that. So there's a licensed naturopaths, but then they need to be un, uh, under the auspices of a medical doctor or a DO overseeing them. Okay, and then I know NMDs, naturopathic medical doctors, yes. and they prescribe and do, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. Did the inability to write, you know, I, I robotically tell people, that's what a doctor does, reach into the pocket, sign, get it off to the pharmacy. Did the inability to do that with your credentials hamper your business, or how are you doing? Uh, it didn't hamper my business because if I, ch if I personally would choose not to take a pharmaceutical drug, then I wouldn't want to prescribe it to them as well. But um, when they do need uh, some acute um, right. prescription drug, maybe, maybe something for their hormones, maybe a, thi uh, a thyroid medication, mm -hmm. then I refer to a um, colleague who's a medical doctor or functional medicine doctor and have them do a blood work and then uh, my colleague then can uh, prescribe the medication if necessary. Okay, so you just answered my next question. Do we have natural in the world of, uh, you know, uh, your pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical world, the world of real food, plant food, supplements, herbs, etc. Do we have uh, natural hormones, do we have natural T1, T3, uh, T3 supplements that help people or does everyone need to go to an MD to get, you know, a thyroid? Medicine? No, we don't, we have, uh, um, our bodies can naturally pr produce the thyroid hormones that we need, but then those thyroid hormones can be inhibited with toxin overload in their thyroid or else it, uh, it can be um, switched off and there can be pathogens in the thyroid. Um, there can be viruses such as viruses or bacteria, but a lot of times there can be mercury toxins or he other heavy metal toxins that inhibit the thyroid. Was that a tough shift going from nursing into running your own business now, and you're very busy over there. Um, 
was it a good move? Do you ever think back and go, wow, I was making 125000 a year. What am I doing <laughs> you know, on, on my own here? Um, it, it, retrospectively, have you enjoyed, how long have you been a naturopath? Uh, six, about 16 years. Okay, so it's a long time. Do you miss nursing? Hmm. <laughs> no, I don't miss nursing. Um, what I originally, I originally went into nursing so that I could take care of people and help them, but it was uh, with a plan of care addressing their spiritual health, their mental, emotional health, and their physical health. What I found was that um, I was, uh, it was all physical health. And then it was uh, pushing pharmaceuticals all the time and not considering anything, anything natural. So eventually the way I healed myself and my family was through natural means and I did that for probably about over 10 years. Mm. So I was in acute care medicine, ICU critical, or critical care and infectious disease for uh, 16 years before I made the switch over and that's because in my conscience I um, I couldn't continue doing that when I knew that it's not something I would have I would be doing for myself. Yeah, and, and what what Dr. Julia has believed all along, we personally know her, our family knows her. Um, the road forks, folks, and most people in the world go this way, doctor after doctor after doctor, and some people choose an option, and that's what Dr. Julia offers. Her website is holistichealingjsjuliashulenberg.com. Look her up and uh, get some more information. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Whoever thought you'd be educated today on television by something called sooty, S-O-O-T-Y, sooty bark disease. I want you to remember three words as I teach this next, what, five minute segment if caught early, if caught early. Here we go. Sooty bark disease is common and often fatal infection of maple and sycamore trees. The bark of these trees are infected with the fungi cryptostroma and other molds. In recent decades, sooty bark disease has expanded throughout Europe and North America and has killed millions and millions, many millions of trees. So the attitude, folks, is, well, it's killing trees. You know, what can that hurt? We can shave them and make paper and logs for burning in the fireplace and so forth. A little bit different as it crosses, you know, from wood and bark to we humans. Let's discuss this. Typically, sooty root disease accelerates during times of drought and or nutrient poor soil. Isn't that fascinating? 2021 that came up. Let's keep going because it's hugely relevant. But sooty bark disease also destroys humans. It can. Sooty bark disease and related hypersensitivity pneumonitis was first reported in five lumberjacks, lumber workers, in 1932. Wow, long time ago, 90 years ago. One study reported that five out of 37 paper mill workers developed sooty bark disease. This wasn't the trees, this was the workers. Sooty bark disease involves sensitization and development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Many human sooty bark cases of hypersensitivity pneumonitis are ultimately fatal. And so it, I don't think you have sooty bark disease. I'm just telling you how little we know. Uh, let's keep going here. <clears throat> the exact prevalence uh, says this paper published in 2021 and mortality rate of sooty bark disease are unknown in the USA. One study estimates sooty bark prevalence in the USA is about two per 100,000 cases. Well, that's about 6,600 annual cases a year in the USA. I think there are probably 6,600 people who work in the paper, people who work in lumber industry, who have this and are running from pulmonologist to internal medicine specialist to family doctor, trying to figure out why they can't breathe. The answer in medicine, folks, often is an antibiotic. Antibiotics can fuel yeast. Okay, but Doug, as this says at the bottom, how do I know? How do I know? Okay, let's first explain what hypersensitivity pneumonitis is. <clears throat> Inflammation of the alveoli, the little sacs within the lungs, in this case caused by the fungus cryptostroma on those, you know, sooty bark trees. Sufferers are commonly exposed to the dust in their occupation or hobby. 
fatalities can occur because diagnosis is delayed, right, if caught early. If you have been outside in an area with many maple or sycamore trees, assist your doctor in the diagnosis by telling him or her that you suspect a tree mold may be linked to your lung condition. That is difficult enough. Oh, sure, where did you get your MD? You see, I have an MD degree and you don't. Don't start that. Be nice. Be kind. But say, Doc, all your antibiotics and I'm still sick. I still have this. On the rare chance that you've been around maples and sycamores who have sooty bark disease, you inhaled and now the alveoli, the little sacs in your lungs, are filled with this cryptostroma fungus and it proliferates through the lungs. Look. If caught early, if caught early, hypersensitivity pneumonitis caused by sooty bark disease mold is a very treatable disease of both humans and animals. Always share as much information about your location and what happened when this began as you can to assist your doctor in the right diagnosis. Isn't that sad that we're saying you've got to assist a doctor in a diagnosis? Your doctor learned this much about bacteria during medical training this much about viruses, and this much about mycology, the study of fungus, and let's even squeeze that sooty bark disease. Very little about sooty bark disease. Very treatable if caught early. By the way, same with cancer of the lung. Many cases, they say hundreds of thousands of cases, can be due to fungus, and yet you go to a, an oncologist, he's not going to test you for fungus, you've got lung cancer. How I wish, how I pray, one day doctors will understand mold is a huge problem, huger, as my grandkids say, than bacteria or virus, most likely. I hope that helps. Did you ever wonder why we here at Know the Cause love green apples and use that as our logo? It's the apple with the highest content of malic acid, a natural ingredient discovered way back in 1785. It makes green apples sour. When used as a dietary supplement, malic acid can re-energize muscle cells and reduce muscle aches. So if you have fibromyalgia, eating green apples or taking malic acid supplements can go a long way. Folks, joining us right now is a guy who's written a book about diet and exercise and being healthy and taking supplements, and he's a cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Lee Cowden's been a friend of mine for decades. Welcome, Lee. Thank you for joining us. Great to be on with you, Doug. Always good to see you. And right now I get to see you from the shoulders, the blue shirt, and the shoulders on up. Uh, my wife and I have been to dinner with you. We've had so many enjoyable times together. You're a thin man. Yet you're a cardiologist. You, by your own testimony, saw patients too late. How you hated to walk into that waiting room and say, guys, your dad's gone. Um, what do you do, understanding the heart and the blood vessels the way you do, what do you do to stay in that shape? Well, first and foremost, I've been on a, a clean diet since 1975. Uh, when I had health challenges myself in medical school, and I took the advice of three different medical school chair, you know, department chairmen and, uh, and got progressively worse. And then my wife's grandmother came to visit us and uh, you know, she was a school teacher, self-taught nutritionist, got me on some vitamins, minerals and herbs. And I got well, and I thought, oh my goodness, I need to learn what this woman knows. I need to take with the salt everything I learned in the med medical institution after this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, since that, since that time I've avoided uh, you know, partial, partially hydrogenated oils, uh, fried foods, uh, excessive sugars, and uh, you know, done physical activity on a regular basis, uh, you know, a variety of natural things. And you know, it doesn't take a lot to, to have health. You, know, you just have to do some basic things, you know, drink, drink enough water every day, two ounces of water every 15 minutes throughout the day, and so on. And, and you talk often in your lectures about how important moving the bowel is. I, I had one time when I was working in clinical nutrition at one of the big hospitals out here, I had a, uh, one of the doctor's patients sit with me and she said, you know, I'm horribly constipated. I only move my bowels once every three days. And I said, have you talked to your doctor about that? 
And she said yes, and he said he only moves his every four days. So that's not the answer. What can, do you like psyllium? Do you like slippery elm you know, to help the bowels? What do you like? Yeah, well, uh, also, you know, one thing is, is drinking enough water you know, so that your bowels are not const constipated because of dehydration, and then also taking enough fiber. You know, a lot of people don't get enough fiber from fruits and vegetables, uh, and so if they don't, you know, they probably ought to at least supplement with some, some fiber from the health food store. I like uh, marshmallow root, uh, slippery elm bark, uh, psyllium, guar gum, acacia gum, uh, rice musil. Th those are all excellent soluble fibers that help to uh, feed the bacteria in your gut. So those are called prebiotics, not probiotics, but prebiotics. So they feed the friendly bacteria in the gut. And the bulk of the stool comes from healthy bacteria dying in your gut and increasing the bulk of your stool. So yeah, if you, you don't just have body, if you don't have enough friendly bacteria. You just look so good and have throughout the decades that I've known you. Uh, uh, thank you for the wise counsel we get from you all the time, Dr. Cowden. Good to see you again. Great to be on, Carl. How many of us have seen that ad on television that says, "Help! I've fallen down and I can't get back up again." We're not here to teach you how to fall down. We're here to teach you what you need to do to learn how to get back up again. It's all muscle, it's all strengthening your body. Exercise does so many things. Physical activity not only helps control your blood pressure and lower your blood sugar, it also helps you manage your weight, strengthen your heart, and even manage your cholesterol. A healthy weight, a strong heart, and general emotional health are all good, as is good blood pressure and good cholesterol levels. Remember, physical activity isn't limited to just lifting weights or doing squats. Was that really 20 years ago? Dr. Dave Holland and I wrote the book, The Fungus Link to Diabetes. Folks, the information, the education just continues on how many, many diseases, what are there, 100 autoimmune diseases? How many of them are named after doctors? A lot of them. How many of those doctors learned about fungus contributing to illness in we humans? Not many. Oh, bacteria. Oh, virus but not fungus, and that's the whole purpose that I wrote these 12, 13 books. Thank you, Dr. Julia, for coming in and continuing our education on hormone diseases and what may cause them. Thank you, Dr. Cowden, for being here. How do you stay in shape, folks? And thank you, Susie Cohen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.